Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to another uh, RLR VMR. And uh, before we talk about the VMR we have in store today, which is really fun, Prof Rez, hello. How are you? What up, what up, what up? How are you, my friend? <laughs> did you go to Morning Report? I did. How was it? It was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're being brief. Reactive huh? arthritis. What's that? Post strep reactive arthritis. Oh, really? That that's triggering. Very tricky. No, I said triggering. Oh, triggering. Why yeah, triggering? That was the that was the diagnosis with Chat GBT. <laughs> the, the, way case that, the case that you weren't there for of, of um your younger and not so wise brother uh versus chat GPT. And um that was the diagnosis that both myself and chat GPT came to. And it's triggering because it's wrong, but I'm glad that there was a case in which it was right. Yeah, it was pretty good. How are you? I'm cruising along good, sir. Very well. Um, we, um, uh, we're going to share um, some, some news with everybody uh, that I think made it on Twitter this morning and would love to share it uh, with all of you here and all of you listening on YouTube. And it's the culmination of so much hard work, but really a lot of a lot of ingenuity. So um, one of our team members, Mariana, had this brilliant idea to take VMR and let it live on in a different form. And uh, she recruited three all-star team members, including Noah, Ibrahim, and Amanda, and put together something really, really special that I'd love to show you um, really quick. And that is the uh, CP Solvers book um, or booklet. Um, this is 100% free. You can see the website right here, and we'll put it in the chat in a second. Um, but in it are essentially VMRs turned into chapters. And if you insist on reading it now, this is what you will see. I'll scroll through it for you. And um, right now we have, um, they have put together four chapters that are very interactive. There's a question and answer to, with each chapter. There's visuals and schemas, but they take each VMR case and they take you through it in a very thought-provoking, highly educational journey. And um, we're four chapters in and hopefully many more in the future, but this gives you a sense of what it's like with the case being outlined here in black and then a reflection on the case, um, more of the case, a reflection on it. And um, you can see uh, that there are questions too, and we go through this over and over again. So if you have a hard time uh, coming up to VMR, uh, if you have a hard time joining VMR in real time, or if you have a hard time, ha like me, having the attention span for a whole hour, um, or if you really like enjoying with a cup of coffee or tea, sitting and reading and reflecting on something you've already thought about, um, this is the solution to all your dilemmas. And um, yeah, I think it, it's a culmination of a lot of creativity, a lot of hard work, and a lot of uh, um, a lot of passion on the part of many of the incredible team members here. I'm sure that there'll be many, many more chapters contributed by many of our team members, but it's a really, really exciting project. And I um, highly recommend you check it out. It's completely free, download it, keep it on um, on your personal files and read it whenever you like. Awesome. Prof Rez, today we have a VMR legend, VJ, who's back to present a case to us. BJ, I'll hand the mic to you to reintroduce yourself um, to the crowd. And maybe Prof Rez, you can jump in and tackle Alcott One if that's cool with you. Awesome. Welcome, BJ. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, myself, BJ. I'm currently uh, doing my residency in pulmonary critical care from uh, All India Institute in Rajasthan, which is the western part of India. Happy to be here after a very long time. It's so nice to see everyone here. We are very, very happy to have you back, Vijay. You're part of the original crowd in VMR. We missed you. Um, now that you are um, training to be an expert, we're thrilled that you're sharing that expertise with us and very excited for your case today. We're ready whenever you are. Uh, I think I'll start. Okay. So uh, I have named this as double trouble. 
So uh, I think I'll give us a shot. The chief concern is a 68 year old gentleman presenting with chronic fevers. So uh, I think I'll, after this, I think I'll go into the HPI. Should I stop here or should I uh, give a little background behind this? DJ, totally, whatever you want. When you say discuss, we will start discussing. Okay. Uh, I think I'll leave it here because okay. uh, the next part is a pretty lengthy one, which has a lot of discussion. So I think awesome. I'm, Well, thank you for that because I love just having a few words to discuss. That lengthy part will go to Robbie. So I think that um, here you already can tell that VJ is an astute clinician because he's included all of the relevant findings to actually start understanding this problem. And what are those relevant findings? He get, he's given us the age, but most importantly, the tempo which is chronic fevers. And once you get chronic fevers, you start going away from your common infections that you often consider like bacterial pneumonia, cellulitis, um, gastroenteritis, and you start going towards unusual infections and non-infectious inflammatory processes. The one thing that we've been thinking about recently is you can still have a common bug causing chronic fever that is hiding in the form of an abscess or in the bone or on the valve. And this is why subacute bacterial endocarditis is such a tricky diagnosis to make. So I think the next steps um, and what you should think about whenever you see C fever, you should make the leap to inflammation because 99% of the time it is the case. And once you make that leap to inflammation, your HPI is gonna be trying to understand where is the patient having symptoms that may be a clue to the site of inflammation. So cough, maybe it's the lung. Chest pain, maybe we're dealing with an inflammatory process within the heart. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I don't even wanna talk about like specific diagnoses just yet. Just know that you can still have a common infection that's just hiding, or more likely it's an atypical infection or a non-infectious inflammatory process. Dr. Balaji, back to you, my friend. Uh, so uh, this history goes back since 2021 where initially he noticed fevers with myalgia, which lasted for about two months. Along with that, at this point of time, he received a short course of steroids and some alternative medicines. Uh, and then there was this mild reduction in the fevers. One month later, patient at that point of time, patient was vaccinated for COVID-19. And one month after the vaccine, he had a recurrence of these fevers which did not subside despite antibiotics and a course of steroids. At that point of time, he was evaluated for the fevers with an imaging and a blood test, which was said to be normal. However, uh, they were not contributing. So uh, this, for these symptoms, he received a prolonged course of steroid about one month during which the fevers completely subsided. And until 20, uh, 2023 of May, the patient was completely fine. So the entire story begins again in 2023 of May, when he developed I mean, audible. Yes, yeah, yeah, you're good. I think you might have frozen for one moment, DJ, but yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So, uh, recurrence of fevers begins again in May 2023, where he had a similar pattern of a high grade fevers with chills, with no rigors, with no systemic localizing clues, a review of systems. Uh, was negative for rash, joint pain, myalgia, headaches, 
fatigue, palpitations. Uh, significant was uh, during this point of time he was evaluated. Uh, I think there are some relevant labs uh, at this point of time that were evaluated with, uh, which can uh, which help us. So uh, the infective workup was negative for uh, uh, HIV, HBSAG, and anti-HCV. Uh, fever workup for Brucella, Bartonella. Um, scrub were negative. S imaging in the form of CT thorax showed uh, mediastinal lymphadenopathy and the splenomegaly. The non-inflammatory uh, workup was positive for an ANA of 1 is to 100. ENA was negative. Rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP and ANCA were negative. Because of these symptoms, patient at this point of time when he was admitted, we uh, did not have any improvement in any of these fevers because patient was treated with steroids even at this point of time. Patient developed an altered sensorium in hospital worsening. So had a worsening with altered sensorium. At this point of time, we had a CBC which showed a HB of 6.8. Total counts of 3,400, platelet 38,000. Ferritin was 1368, MCV of 64, LDH 160, urea of 40, creatinine was 2.4. The urine microscopy was within normal limits with no sediments or proteins. CSF, MRI brain and CSF were normal. Multiple blood cultures were negative. Positives were a calcium of 11.4, an ionized calcium of 1.7, and a PTH of uh, 4, 4. Uh, the lab value cutoff here is 6. The serum AC levels were 124. The serum protein electrophoresis was normal. A bone marrow done in view of cytopenia was showed a hypocellular marrow with normal maturation with no atypical cells or blasts. I think I would stop here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Prof. I, I think that the this journey is really interesting and is initially characterized by prolonged fevers and then has some more specific symptoms. So I'll just kind of reflect maybe, uh, reflect maybe on the fever itself before it starts to have some uh, accompanying features. And I think uh, this reflection is probably better held in another context, and that context is pain. And why do I talk about that? Because pain and fever are related in the fact that they are serving as a warning sign for something that's about to come. What do I mean by that? The point of pain inherently is to warn you that subsequent consequences are about to happen on the order of seconds if your hand is on uh, a stove, um, hours if you have a bad infection, and maybe minutes if your aorta is tearing. So the whole point of pain is to warn you about something coming your way. It's like a fire alarm. And when a fire alarm buzzes, you look around and you see, okay, what's going on here? Where's the problem from? And you use every tool you have, your eyes, your ears, your nose, and you often find the source of the problem and address it. Or if you're like Nari or bark at it, which doesn't do anything. Uh, but if you look around and you see nothing over and over and over again, the first thing you'll say is you'll doubt yourself. You'll be like, I'm sure there's something. I'm just not missing it. Uh, maybe it'll declare itself in a moment. Maybe I'll figure it out that it's the three houses down the hallway. But if nothing ever happens for a long, long time, ultimately you'll say that the fire alarm is the problem. How is this helpful with fever? Fever is supposed to tell you if there is an infection that's going to take your life or a cancer that's going to take your life. What does it mean when the fever goes on and on and on and on and on and on for a while and nothing happens? It's much more likely that the fever is the problem. And what is that called? That's called autoimmunity. So what happens if you look at case series of patients presenting with fever of unknown origin? 
what has happened is the vast majority of fever of unknown origin in the modern era has now either become idiopathic, will get better by itself, or autoimmune. Why? We've gotten so much better at diagnosing infection, so much better at diagnosing malignancies, that if it really is an unknown origin with um, the technology that exists in the world and with diagnosticians like Prof. Rez, nothing can sneak by them. So uh, I'm buttering you up before your part, my friend. You ready? Remember the last last VMR, we were told that we flirted with each other for 40 minutes. So <laughs> let's try to make it 50. Um, but yeah, I think that that was the flavor that my mind was going towards. Of Oh, nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. Maybe the problem is the fever itself. But it's interesting to park that and reflect on that as in May 2023, the story changes quite a bit. Um, so it's interesting to try to think th of those two things together. So ultimately, at least it seems like we did find the source of the fire, but it's curious that it took so, so long, but, um, I'll pass the mic to you, Prof. Rez, for what you were thinking of all of this, especially the, the subsequent data. I, I love what you said about like the fever being the alarm system and what happens when we actually don't identify the etiology. And I'll be honest with you, you know, when I see all this data, the thing that grabs my attention the most is the lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly. So I'm most concerned for a lymphoproliferative process, either of primary origin or reactive. And if you do this enough, it's hard not to think does this patient have HLH? And HLH is just stamping a pattern on the patient's presentation, meaning when adults have HLH, the next question is what's driving the HLH? You see the anemia here with the microcytosis. You have the thrombocytopenia. You have the high ferritin. You have these high fevers. And so all of this is further supporting our initial assumption that this patient has inflammation. And I was just pulling up on MD Calc, um, the H score, and we can, someone can throw it in the chat, but it's a scoring system to predict the probability of hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. In general, it's important to understand this pattern because it can be another alarm to something dangerous happening. Meaning when you diagnose HLH, you gotta react quickly um, to that information. The tempo though is reassuring in itself, like the chronicity of the patient's fever. Like if you think about sinister causes of fever, um, whether it be tuberculosis, an aggressive lymphoma, it's unlikely to continue like this and not debilitate the patient. This has been going on for years now. And Robbie, the one other clue I took from all of this was the steroid responsiveness. So I'm not sure yet whether that initial phase is part of the bigger picture and became quiet because we suppressed that immune system. The biopsy is interesting. Before being reassured with the biopsy, understand biopsy is like any test. The other day we did an echo and there was no LV thrombus. We repeated the echo and there was an LV thrombus. Someone is reading that. Whenever you have a biopsy, this is a, a general principle. You may not get the site of the actual pathology. This applies to any biopsy you perform. So oftentimes when I see patients and I tell them, hey, we're about to do a biopsy, we're either going to get good news, bad news, or no news. The no news is the sampling error that you have to um, accommodate. So I think with the bicytopenias, the splenomegaly, the lymphadenopathy, I'm framing it as HLH. And then with HLH, I'm saying, is it due to an autoimmune process like lupus? In general, lupus in a male is less common, but when it does occur, it occurs like this, very aggressive. 
And Robbie gave a stellar discussion on one of our cases that we try to pitch to NEJM. If you remember, we had the we actually had the editor, the previous editor of Nagem for like decades, listen to Robbie discuss the case. And uh, well, the outcome didn't turn out the way we wanted, but it wasn't a reflection of Robbie's discussion. Um, and so you have the then you have the viral processes, and these are primarily your infectious mononucleosis. Here we've ruled out the HIV. There's EBV, there's CMV, and then note that just because you diagnose one process doesn't mean there's an there's not another process. Like EBV can be lingering in the background, leading to an EBV associated lymphoproliferative disorder. And the other thing I thought about Robbie is whenever I get like this lymphadenopathy picture and we don't have a DX, I'm not only considering lymphoma that's like slow and can become aggressive, but it's cousins. And we recently discussed a case of Castleman's syndrome, but thinking of that bucket as well. So I am looking forward to more information, but where my mind is, is less likely infection and most concern for some lymphoproliferative process, either a lymphoma that hasn't been diagnosed yet, or an autoimmune process that's leading to an HLH phenotype. And I think the one reassuring thing here, Robbie, is that it's been going on for so long, it hasn't killed the patient. I would love your thoughts though, because it was such a rich aliquot, anything to add or dissect there? That was outstanding, absolutely outstanding. I just love the way that you're um, translating these hematological findings into an HLH signature. And I love the approach to a negative biopsy. I wrote that in my Evernote. Um, I promise I gave you credit. Uh, no, <laughs> news, no news, good news and bad news. That is such a, that's, folks, if you're not, if if you don't know, um, if you're, in, if you just enjoyed that um, teaching, it's probably because it's meant for you to enjoy it. And I'd love for you to pay attention for one second to just how much work is required to simplify such a complicated concept into such a tangible um, teaching point. So unless Prof Rez, you stole it from somebody else, I think we should. Who do you think I got? Who do you think I stole it from? There is uh, one person I did steal it from. Probably Gurpreet. It sounds like a Gurpreetism. Is it? And I, dude, anything that guy says, like I, my mind is just wired to remember every word. <laughs> Literally anything he says. Amazing. Uh, well, all right. I'm still celebrating you because you remembered it and passed it on. But thank you, Gurpreet. All right, Vijay, back to you, please. Uh, so, uh, patient now was uh, was transferred. Uh, so, as we had uh, discussed, brilliant discussions of keeping uh, very broad and keeping fever in the background. So, uh, with these reports of PDH independent hypercalcemia and uh, with uh, reticular endothelial activation and the high uh, AC levels. The patient was probably diagnosed as uh, sarcoidosis. A provisional diagnosis of sarcoidosis was made. However, uh, there is no uh, any histological evidence that we had. So at an outside center, he was started on steroids and patient responded. Uh, so steroids and methotrexate were started and patient was completely fine until he presented to our center in October end 2023. So he has presented now again with recurrence of fever despite optimal steroids and methotrexate. And the new symptom now was a right-sided chest pain. And uh, yeah, right-sided chest pain. So fever and right-sided chest pain. So these are his symptoms, current presentation. So past medical history was uh, in the background, he has an uncontrolled diabetes hypertension, and Meniere's disease. Social history, uh, he has had a recent pilgrimage all over India. He has traveled all over India. Uh, there are no pets or cattle at home, but probably retrospectively, he has had exposure to a significant amount of pigeons. And he performs a daily gardening. Very actively, he gardens and farms. Uh, no significant allergies and uh, no uh, abnormal behavior. So he's uh, socially monogamous and uh, 
and nothing significant in the past medical history or any of this. So I think I'll go to the vitals as well. Uh, BP was 124 by 70. Heart rate was 134. Temperature of 103 Fahrenheit. Saturation and respiratory rate were normal. Examination, right upper zone patient had crackles on the pulmonary exam and moderate hepatosplenomegaly on the abdominal exam. And neurologically, he had some paresthesias, uh, which were non-specific and did not have any focal localization. The general systemic examination was non-contributory. Uh, the cardiac examination was uh, non-contributory as well. And uh, pulmonary exam, there has a right upper, upper uh, zone crackles. So I think I'll give uh, uh, one lab, I think uh, basic labs, I think CBC of 9.9, .9, total counts of 2.76, neutrophil 87%, lymphocyte 7%, uh, platelet count of 76,000, urea of 43, creatinine of 0.98. I think uh, I'll leave it at this. Amazing, Vijay. Can I just clarify? So the total white blood cell count was, uh, can you repeat that one more time, please? Uh, 2,600. 2,600. So basically the patient remains pancytopenic. And the one question I have, if you have that available, oh, no, go ahead, sorry. Yes. Please, you were yeah, gonna say so one point to add, I, I think I'd missed this. Uh, throughout this hospitalization, since May 2023 to uh, the time of presentation, Mild pancytopenic picture was persistent. I see. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. And then I ask you one more question because we were tracking it before the calcium. Is that data available or, or do you yeah. want to? Uh, so, yeah. no, uh, calcium is 8.7 hmm. and uh, calcium is 8.7. It's not. Amazing. Um, I think that you taught us a lot, Vijay, and you taught us a lot about what people were thinking because you said reticular, chronic reticular endothelial activation. And that were those words were used to make render a diagnosis. So reticular endothelial activation refers to the notion of the disease that tracks the three organs that the hematological system courses through the lymph nodes, the spleen, and the bone marrow. And whenever you have chronic reticular endothelial activation, um, the that uh, that uh, clinical observation maps onto a fairly high predictive phenotype of a granulomatous disease. So if you're asking yourself, what does a granulomatous disease like sarcoid or tuberculosis look like on imaging? It looks like the lymph nodes, the spleen, and the marrow. You don't see the marrow on the imaging, but you merge that with the marrow findings on CBC of cytopenia. So what Vijay said when he said chronic reticular endothelial activation is the com combination of radio radiology, lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, and the inference that cytopenias, especially if chronic, represent a bone marrow issue. So I think it's very fair to say that this patient, um, um, we are solving a problem that very much looks like a chronic granulomatous issue. And the question immediately becomes, is there any other chronic granulomatous disease apart from sarcoidosis? And the answer is absolutely yes. The longer the patient uh, has a, a granulomatous disease, the, the more likely it is to be idiopathic and likely sarcoid. But that has to be a journey that is of relative health not full of uh, wealthy uh, data collection and problems the patient has. So if this patient had a smooth course and had a persistent improvement on immunosuppression, I think it would be a fantastic diagnosis. However, the, la the fact that he has such a topsy-turvy course should prompt that diagnosis into question. Uh, and I would say there's another big red flag against the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. And that red flag is the age of the patient. Only less than 5% with patients with sarcoidosis are diagnosed or have disease at the onset of the age of 60 or above. Sarcoidosis is a disease of young or middle-aged adults, not anybody over the age of um, 60. So if it's possible to diagnose GCA or temporal arteritis in a patient, it is impossible to diagnose sarcoid comfortably. So if you begin by assuming that it's an uncomfortable diagnosis because of his age, and then you become more uncomfortable by 
the fact that his journey is not the lazy river of joy, but a, a roller coaster full of uh, twists and turns, you really have to question the diagnosis. And the, the question then becomes, well, what are the mimickers of sarcoidosis? And the most important ones are liquid tumors like lymphomas and granulomatous infections. And so we have to scrutinize the background information for two things. First is, does the patient have an immunocompromising condition that will result in a disseminated granulomatous infection? And the answer here is yes. He has uncontrolled diabetes. The second question is, um, does the patient have any exposure history that would be in line with a chronic disseminated granulomatous infection? And the answer is yes. But what's the ultimate clue? Because risk factors are just risk factors. They just tell you the patient could have it. They don't tell you more about what the patient currently has. Whenever you're invoking a chronic granulomatous disease, and you're not sure if it's sarcoid or if it's um, uh, an infection, the presence of intrapulmonary findings, which is the portal of entry for the majority of granulomatous infections like tuberculosis, those really prioritize a disseminated granulomatous infection. The best clue to the presence of sarcoid is the cardiac manifestations of sarcoid, which result in conduction system disease, like bradycardia and arrhythmias, which are unusual in any other form of granulomatous diseases. So what I'm really paying attention to is the ratio of pulmonary parenchymal findings and the EKG. This patient with a heart rate of 134 does not have, likely does not have conduction system disease in the form of AV block. And that alone um, makes me put sarcoid less. And the fact that he has crackles in the right upper zone has us hurtling towards a chronic granulomatous infection. Um, a short list of those granulomatous infections are mycobacterial diseases and the endemic mycoses of which in India, it's really important to think about histoplasmosis and its cousin, teleromycosis or teleromyces. Um, but I'll leave it at that. I will tell you that um, there are some really fun predictive tools that you can use to engage the possibility of TB versus histoplasmosis because those end up being the most notorious and complicated mimics of sarcoid. I'll leave it for us to reflect on later, but the pattern that we are seeing here is more suggestive of histoplasmosis than it is of TB, but it's too soon to take that to the bank. So I think the next steps are the, the first step is to put a uh, massive, massive set of breaks on the diagnosis of sarcoidosis and to investigate thoroughly and deeply with every tool we have, beginning with blood and urine tests and maybe even with a bronchoscopy and biopsy, the possibility of a disseminated uh, granulomatous infection. Um, a prof is at a meeting, so he'll skip this aliquot, but um, I'll summarize for him uh, uh, what you give us next, DJ. Uh, coming to the current, I will give further labs. The sodium was 134, potassium was 4.2, calcium was 8.7, LFT, uh, the SGOT, SGPT was 65, and ALT was 65, AST is 17, ALCFOS of 121, uh, it is in the normal in, in the lab. Uh, we have a ferritin that was repeated, that was again 1,600. Fibrinogen 442, triglyceride of 147. Urine microscopy was normal, the urine ACR was 48. A CD4 of 39%. And an IGRA that was done was negative. Chest X-ray shows the right upper lobe consolidation. Uh, I think I can show you the CT as well. Please, yeah, uh, you're able to share screen if you like.
I think you should be able to, VJ. Go for it. Um, oh, there you go. Okay. That Thank you for preparing it. We really appreciate it. I think it's uh, taking a moment to play. Some issue with my computer. Okay. No problem. Take your time. Go. Hmm. So, uh, this was a 4R. This is a right paratracheal node that was in there. There's a necrotic cavity deletion here. Uh, and the splenomegaly, the hepatomegaly that was seen. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you, Vijay. This is uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, especially for uh, just appreciating how necrotic that lesion was. Very, maybe you uh, can yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is a mediational window as well. I mean, this is a mediational window. There is no effusions or anything. Uh, the uh, this lung window. Uh, lung window also shows similar findings. Uh, we have a dense uh, cavity consolidation. So there's a Cavitary lesion with intracavitary contents with the surrounding consolidation and the renal bronchograms, and some mild reticular changes in the right lower lobe. Fine reticulations. Uh, apart from this, the CT was not. Ready. Thank you so much, Vijay. This was so elucidating. Prof. Rez, yeah. I, I'm not sure how much of that you caught. Oh, sorry, Vijay. Do you want to? I think I give the uh, marrow as well because I think. Next step would be marrow. This is a marrow that so there are some intracellular inclusions. Uh, the same thing in a highlighted view here. There is a secondary hemophagocytic uh, hemophagocytosis that is seen and some intracellular inclusions. Uh, this was consistent with histoplasma, was what the lab said. Uh, I think I would leave it here. Uh, a patient was started on amphotericin B in view of histoplasmosis. Despite his uh, uh, optimal dose of amphotericin, patient continued to have persistent fever spikes. Wow. Prof Rez, uh, would you like me to summarize for you uh, what data we got? Okay, so we learned um, after the background information, we learned the patient has uncontrolled diabetes and has a uh, quite an impressive exposure history, which we can see on the whiteboard in a moment. Um, on exam, he was febrile to 103 and tachycardic, and ultimately was found to have a focus of uh, pulmonary disease with a necrotic cavitary lymph uh, 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 mass as well as lymphadenopathy. And then I think you just heard about his bone marrow findings, 
which um, yeah, I think you heard the rest. So that's where um, that's where things are now. Awesome. Would you like me to start the discussion? Absolutely, please. <laughs> thank you for updating updating me. And Vijay, thank you for those images. Very striking images. Um, maybe I can start talking about the CT scan and then leave the bone marrow for you to discuss, Robbie. But I think um, it's very, very helpful. And it was... I also caught the first part of that physical exam and the patient had pulmonary findings. So now we can say we're dealing with a multi-systemic disease entity. And if it's infectious in origin, the entry point was the lung. Note I said, if it is infectious in origin. And whenever you're dealing with cavitary lung lesions, I do wanna make a quick comment, the necrosis, Necrosis is very simple. It's just tissue that's dying. And why tissue might die is either the cells are outgrowing the blood supply to the tissue. So we see this often in rapidly growing cancers, or you have an infectious angio-invasive process that's diminishing the supply to the tissue. So necrosis is just a supply demand issue similar to myocardial infarction where it's a supply or demand issue. Now, when you're dealing with this cavitary lung lesion, it's actually helpful to know which lobe that cavitary lung lesion is specifically when you're trying to think of that prioritized uh, DDX for infectious etiologies. And the tempo is very important. Like it would be really unlikely that this is an acute cavitary lung lesion, but because we do have that necrosis, we have to consider it, meaning, Robbie, maybe the patient had some autoimmune etiology, got steroids, became immunocompr immunocompromised, and then had a second hit of an acute infectious process. So we can't eliminate that possibility. Maybe this is a consequence of what we've done to the patient, and the real process is somewhere in the background. So right away, whenever you see this Robbie has created one of the most amazing cavitary lung lesion schemas. If someone can put it in the chat for the group to, to look at, but thinking of staph, strep, klebsiella as organisms that can cause necrosis. But this is where you got to be flexible with your frame. You got to be flexible in that maybe that cavitary lung lesion, even though we're seeing necrosis, isn't actually acute in nature and is more consistent with the the tempo that we've received from the patient. So now we go into the world of subacute infectious processes and non-infectious processes that we've been discussing all along. And I will say that endocarditis is very tricky. So if you have a vegetation on the right side of the valve, that thing can embolize to the lung, causing cavitary lesions. But usually you're going to get multiple hits, not a single cavitary lesion. So if we go into the um, subacute infectious etiologies, this is where we go to those unusual organisms that we talked about in aliquot one. We said it's not typical infections, but the less common, I don't say atypical, but they can get confusing because we do have like atypical pneumonias and we think of particular organisms, but unusual infections. And this is where you start thinking about mycobacterial disease and its cousins. And for mycobacterial, you have TB and then you have non-tuberculous mycobacterium. The reason TB is its own bucket is because it's special. It's the most, probably most common mycobacterial disease to cause infection. A lot of people may have non-TB MAC or the mycobacterium avium complex, but it's very difficult to tease. Is that colonizing? Is that causing an infection? This patient in, is from India. I'm from Iran. I um, converted a positive PPD. So I have late, late in tuberculosis. I went on isoniazid. So tuberculosis has to be considered. When you start saying multiple organs, you would be wrong for not saying, why can't this all be TB? You know, why can't this all be TB? Um, so TB and its cousins, the cousins of TB include nocardia, include its cousin actino, and then include its distant relative, which is fungal infections like histoplasmosis, so a patient like this, you really got to send 
those serum tests, antigen fungal markers, um, because anything TB does, histo can do as well. Anything TB does, histo can do as well. And if you're in Southeast Asia, anything TB does, histo can do. So can um, pseudomolobercoldaria, uh, the cause of miliodosis. I didn't pronounce it correctly, but it, it has. It sounds like something like that. And yeah, so, you know, I think for the infection, it's TB, endemic fungi, and the actinonocardia. Nocardia particularly can be very uh, invasive. And because of the diabetes history, you got to consider mucormycosis, um, which has like an angioinvasive phenotype. But, you know, I'll be frank, like the splenomegaly, the lymphadenopathy makes me also worried about lymphoma and lymphoma-like processes that we talked about, like Kaposi's and... Um, because Kaposi's can cause a cavitary lung lesion, but the tempo, again, like it would be just quite unusual. So Robbie, just with the CT findings and the story, um, with an unusual infection, TB, endemic fungal, um, endemic mycosis, or a filamentous organism, or lymphoma, or its cousin Kaposi's. But I would love to see how you're integrating the other data points to make more progress on that. Rafraz, I feel like you're outing like the mafia family of all the horrible infections. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the big boss, Rafraz? Who is it? I mean, Rob, Robbie Jan yeah, is the big boss, baby. <laughs> that was amazing. You know, I think that uh, I don't have anything to add to, to your reflection on how you're balancing all these things and their complex interrelationship between all of them. And I think the, the part that I'm grappling with to layer onto that and to help prioritize based on this data point is what do the intracellular inclusions signify? And I think we're hearing that, um, I think what they, what they do tell us just as a general observation is that the bacterial causes of disseminated granulomatous infections that Prof. has outlined, those are usually tiny. So you should not be able to visualize them with your microscope. And you, otherwise, you imagine how much of a waste of time it would be to culture MTB for six weeks to, to wait till you see it big enough to be seen. So um, if you just use these as, as a powerful data point, which I can't because I don't have much experience with whether these are noise or this could be background or unrelated. So, but I do know that if we ascribe, if we ascribe significance to these inclusions, it's very unlikely that um, uh, a bacterial cause that Prof. Rez outlined would be uh, as the sole contributor. Intracellular inclusions are much more consistent with macroscopic organisms like the endemic mycoses. And we already heard that the, the, the that, um, that um, the uh, pathologist thinks it's very much in line with histoplasmosis, a diagnosis further supported by the high urinary antigen of histoplasmosis, which I just saw, by the way, I didn't realize we had that data. Uh, but I think the tension is, Prof. Rez, we have a disseminated histoplasmosis and the patient is on amphotericin. Why is the patient not getting better? And in fact, the lack of improvement with amphotericin should have us question any fungal uh, uh, diagnosis, recognizing that, of course, the patient might not improve because they have superimposed immunodeficiency, that that, and we need to control the diabetes, we need to control why their immune system is not working, or that they have immunological excess, and that the patient has an HLH uh, uh, finger, uh, fingerprint to his disease process and might need to damp down his immune system. So to summarize the conversation so far, um, I have one more aspect to reflect on based on, based on insight that Prof. Rez um, outlined is the inclusions unlikely to be bacteria alone, the granulomatous bacteria, more consistent with fungi. The fungi plus amphotericin colliding without improvement means that maybe it's not a fungus, maybe it's something else, or maybe it's the issue is the immune system, a deficiency or an excess. But the question is, could the inclusions be any other macroscopic organism? And I hadn't even thought of this possibility at all until Prof. Rez said out loud, could the lung, essentially, Prof. Rez said, could the lung be a distractor? You didn't say those words, Prof. Rez, but you essentially said that the, the lung problem wasn't there in the beginning. It wasn't there. And we had a lymph node and spleen problem the whole time. And then the lung shows up. So did it show up because the disease progressed to involve it? Or did it show up, as you eloquently said, because of the steroids causing a separate unrelated issue? And so if we then say, let's just see what the case looks like if we remove the lung and say that's a complication, then we have a disseminated, uh, uh, inf uh, then we have a 
uh, retic pure reticuloendothelial disease with intracellular inclusions in a patient from India. And that should trigger the possibility of visceral lesmoniasis, VL. Why do I know this? I know this from the most amazing case I've ever seen in my entire career as a fourth year medical student at UCSF, very impressionable, when a patient with this exact same story finally came to UCSF. And after many years of suffering, she was diagnosed with visceral lesmoniasis by an astute pathologist who recognized that the inclusions she had were not histoplasmosis, but they were actually amastigotes from visceral lesmoniasis. And I remember that because I wasn't taking care of her, but we were in the middle of a lecture and the heme, uh, the ID attending Brian Schwartz, I don't know if you remember him, Prof Rez, he gets a call in the middle of giving a lecture and he, he pauses the lecture and says, all of you have to, ID fellows, students, residents, all of us left the room and we went to the microscope to see these like amastigotes. Uh, that the patient had. And so you can see how much of a power of impression it made on me, which may be completely uh, 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 irrelevant today, but an important thought, which I did not have because I was so locked into solving the lung problem. And I think, Prof. Rez, you're absolutely right. It could be a complete distractor. I think it's important to spend 10 seconds on non-infectious -in mimickers. And I don't know this disease well enough, but if you say chronic immunological activation and uh, bone marrow inclusions, we should all start to practice thinking about a highly underdiagnosed and new condition called vexus, with the V in vexus standing for bone marrow vacuoles. There are many other features of this case that don't align with that, but I'm trying to practice that reflex because many of our patients with vexus are underdiagnosed. It's to think bone marrow vacuoles um, and think of excess. But Prof. Rez, um, I think this is either uh, um, endemic mycosis and there's something wrong with the immune system, or this is visceral lesmoniasis with the lung stuff, either being a manifestation of VL that I don't know of, or actually what you said, which is the steroids are causing us to have the problem be more complicated than it is. But I've said a lot based on, on the inclusions, which I wouldn't even know how to interpret in real life. Uh, but I'm curious what you think of that, where if you had any other thoughts since I've been babbling away and I'll pass the mic to you. This is why you always want to be a co-discussant with Robbie because he pulls a rabbit out of the hat. I First of all, I love your story with Brian Schwartz and I, I can't wait to learn from VJ. I have zero to add. Thank you for that. Amazing thoughts, uh, like just brilliant uh, discussions. Uh, I think we were also thinking on the similar lines, whether the uh, whatever we are seeing the lung is just a secondary, secondary to what the immunosuppression, or was it primary? So uh, we got an RK39 antigen that uh, was negative for a visceral leishmania, and the urinary histoplasma was positive, and the pathologist read it as intracellular inclusions consistent with histoplasma. Uh, but what was uh, not completely fitting was uh, persistent fevers despite amphotericin. Uh, so we went ahead with the bronchoscopic biopsy of the uh, from bowel and the lymph node, the paratracheal lymph node that was there, and that was positive for. Uh, Mycobacterium, the CBNAT gene expert was positive for MTB. Uh, but again, there is a catch here. So patient was started on anti-tubercular drugs and an optimal dose of uh, amphotericin. We started at a lower dose because it was a lung issue. It was started around 3 mg per kg, liposomal amphotericin with an optimal dose of uh, uh, ATT, ripe regimen. Uh, and then patient was switched to the oral regimen after the patient was afebrile for about 10 days after this therapy. After switching to uh, itraconazole, patient started developing fevers on day four. Uh, so uh, for now we have histoplasma with the TB. Any thoughts uh, or any investigation that you would think of? Uh, an echocardiogram showed no vegetations, the infective endocarditis, multiple cultures were negative. Uh, any thoughts what could be going on? Uh, we also got a therapeutic drug monitoring for this case because we were concerned 
if the dose of amphotericin was adequate and the itraconazole dosing was adequate. So the ATT dosing was adequate, the therapeutic levels. And initial dose of uh, itraconazole was low and it was optimized. A repeat case, a repeat uh, drug levels were normal, but still the fevers were persistent. So I think I leave it at this. <laughs> Progress, we have some work to do. <laughs> Apparently, we're, we're, I, I talk so much. I feel like you should share your thoughts. I feel like um, this case is going to go on till next Friday. Oh, Vijay, so, go uh, ahead. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. I think I, I missed the one important clue. Uh, when these persistent fevers were going on, the patient complained of a mild headache. This was what I was waiting for. <laughs> now, it has to be obvious to every listener. <laughs> Mild headache. Interesting. So, Robbie, what? Okay. It's interesting in that, like, there seems to be multiple issues at play. I firmly believe this diagnosis of MTB. You have a cavitary lesion. They sampled it. It's a high endemic er area. So, I, I believe in that diagnosis. The histoplasmosis, I'm still a little, I'm questioning. I'm questioning for the reasons you mentioned with amphotericin. And also there was like an incredible tutorial by a pathologist who said, once you have like necrosis and dead organisms from histo, it shouldn't cause inflammation. Um, though the necrosis was associated with the MTB. This visceral leishmaniasis hypothesis, where I just don't know enough about these tests, like the anti, like I don't know enough about the L. So that's something I would look up or ask you as to whether that takes away the post-test probability or eliminates that, that, that hypothesis. If we've considered every infection, mycobacterial, we're treating endemic mycosis, we're not treating visceral leishmaniasis. So the question is, could there be a non-infectious process that's evading a diagnosis? Now, intravascular lymphoma is always an interesting hypothesis, but the thing that pushes me away from that is the LDH. I mean, I would repeat an LDH, but usually those LDH and those patients is sky high with mild spinal megaly, and then you do the random skin biopsies. If this headache is mild, BJ, I'm just going to be honest. It seems like it's an important clue, but I probably wouldn't even incorporate it into my problem representation unless it was severe. And if it was severe, then I would say, wait a minute. Is there something going on in the CNS that's driving this inflammation? And do I need to pursue a lumbar puncture or not? Um, so I think it all depends on how severe this headache is, but it may prompt me to get an MRI with GAD, if possible, to see if there's any kind of enhancement, leptomeningeal or patchy um, based on that. But Robbie, I have zero idea of like what to do. I, I really don't know. And I can't wait to learn. Me neither. Prof. Friends, I, I I was thinking, Vijay, I thought you said this was double trouble. Is we already have TB and histo. This is maybe like quadruple or pentad trouble. How many, how many troubles are we gonna find? Yeah. Um, I think it's really <laughs> tricky, Prof. Rez. I think it just goes to show you how in medicine, even when you find two rare diagnoses, disseminated TB and disseminated histo, you could still find more. So when when do you stop? I think the idea that the patient might have uh, uh, infection in their brain, um, based on, based on the, based on the context clues that we're giving here that he might have something in his head. I agree with you. I wonder if he's having iris maybe from crypto because he already has so many things, which you, you already basically said, you already said he has a non-infectious cause of fever, but maybe he has crypto in his brain and he's having iris from the info. Um, and then, uh, finally, I think that like the, the other part of the, the approach is, you know, is this a, a, a is this a granulomatous bacteria? We found TB. Is this a fungus? We found histo. Are we going to find crypto? Um, is there? I don't know what the test characteristics of this antigen is, but I think the the question that is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger is um, to think about the immune system and to say, could it be overactivated in iris, or does this person have um, an underlying immunodeficiency that's causing him to have so many aggressive granulomatous infections? And it's curious because he's not having any aggressive staph, any aggressive normal stuff. He's having aggressive granulomatous infections. And so wondering, does he have an acquired uh, interferon gamma antibody, which is also very well described. And so basically I would, I, we don't have time to ramble about this space, but now I think the open door is, is there crypto? 
uh, is there iris and is there uh, a systemic immunocompromising condition such as an anti-cytokine antibody like interferon gamma that is predisposing this patient to have um, so many bad granulomatous uh, infections? Can I just say, Robbie, the iris is such a good hypothesis, because you can get that in immunocompetent hosts that are being treated for TB, as we learned uh, recently. It's it's a really interesting thing. Amazing, uh, amazing thoughts. Uh, so we were at a loss because patient only complaint was fever. My fevers are not going down. So we had nothing to... Uh, so we were really concerned. So... Uh, uh, one thing was we repeated a immunoglobulin profile, which was essentially normal. Uh, the CD4 counts, uh, the total counts are about 401 and the percentage was 39. Essentially lower normal, not significantly low. But one thing was the mild headache that uh, really made us think patient having so many issues. So is there something uh, unusual? So we repeated an MRI. Uh, MRI showed multiple ring enhancing lesion with uh, uh, with central necrosis, suggestive of a cerebral abscess. So uh, in the uh, temporoparietal region on the left side. So uh, we were at a loss of why this could happen because patient had received a 3 mg per milligram, fairly okay dose of amphotericin. Uh, so here we asked our ID colleagues to help. So uh, uh, this is what they had to tell. Maybe here, uh, uh, the recommended dosing whenever there is so cerebral involvement, the dose of amphotericin is at a higher dose of about 5 to 10 mg per kg and a duration of about 6 weeks. Because here uh, we could not sample this before uh, 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 because the location was in the posterior cerebral fossa. So uh, we are not able to uh, uh, sample this. So the patient is currently shot on 10 mg per kg of amphotericin and uh, since 2 days the patient is afebrile and is doing well. Yeah, I just say one thing. Um, Vijay, you are so brilliant, my friend. And I love how it was the abscesses that finally had you <laughs> consult ID. I would have consulted ID at Aliquot 1 or before Aliquot 1. <laughs> but finally, Vijay's uh, knowledge <laughs> was that. But I'm going to pass the mic to Robbie. Thank you so much. Just your... You know what I was most impressed about? Like you knew the dose, like it just, you the management and the diagnose. I'm just um, very impressed by you. Thank you, Vijay. I'm in the exact same space, Vijay. It's really a treat to be able to reflect on this case. And I think, honestly, we, we should probably learn from you uh, instead of me babbling away about how you put all this together. So in retrospect, wh what do you think explains the patient's journey from 2021 until now, finally, where he has no fever? For two years, so uh, this was uh, it was very unusual uh, because uh, we don't see much of histoplasma uh, in India, at least where we practice. Uh, so the only point against for me was uh, the first diagnosis of Harcourt disease that was made, uh, the age of presentation, like you mentioned, the age of presentation, and the cytopenia that was persistent. Um, without a significant marrow involvement in sarcoid, but is rare. So that made me question the diagnosis of sarcoidus in the first place. And because the right upper lobe consolidation, very common in India to think of TB. So, so is it a bystander or is it a causation like uh, we were discussing? So we thought significant methotrexate and steroids. So we thought maybe he's immunosuppressed and hence he's developing secondary infection. We also considered probabilities of Burkhold area as well because of uncontrolled diabetes and uh, necrotic lesions in the lung as well. But however, the sampling was negative. So we thought we had the diagnosis, then we had an, uh, and the bone marrow that revealed a significant intracellular inclusions and histoplasmosis. Uh, we also considered leishmania, like we are thinking, but the RK39 antigen, uh, it is an immunochromatographical test which has a good sensitivity for visceral leishmania. So that being negative, uh, it was little on the lower for us. Some parts of India, like uh, some states, are very endemic to leishmania. Uh, Rajasthan somehow was not very endemic. So uh, only this one was, we thought we had the case when he got a histo and the TB. We were very happy with the diagnosis. But then, like persistent fevers, we had a response. Then patient didn't respond. So we repeated a ball as well multiple times, twice or thrice, because we want to really be sure that no, we are not missing out on any hospital-acquired infection as well. 
so that was uh, not there as well so the only thing that the fevers and the neurological issues showed up at a later point so retrospectively maybe i would think because we have not seen much of histoplasmosis i would like to ask because it is common in the us so how common is uh, histoplasma with direct cns involvement and presenting silently like you know without any signature systemically is it common to histoplasma for uh, being this way i am not really sure so this is how we solved the case what is uh, not telling you ravi <laughs> Uh, uh, Nara is uh, Nara is saying, <clears throat> "I need to read before I can tell yeah. you." <laughs> Sorry, DJ. Our complete silence is because we can't answer that that question. Yeah. So, so this was our uh, thoughts behind all of this. But I think it's amazing to hear your thoughts, DJ, and how you put it all together. It makes a lot of sense, and I think one thing that really sticks with me that Prof Raz said in this case as a big picture theme is how when you pour in steroids how the the complexion can change. I don't know the answer to your question, but I think it's a question that will unfortunately be modified by the fact that this person probably had histoplasmosis the whole time and how the fact that he was given high dose steroids for a long time, how does that influence the presentation? Um, that's going to be really, really key um, and makes it really, really hard to solve this problem. But I, this is a breathtaking case that ultimately actually really illustrates basic fundamental principles of diagnosis, which is how complicated empiric treatment can be, but how powerful a clue it is to the diagnosis um, with the fact that the patient didn't quite improve and ultimately how it can be a powerful clue, but is it really worth it? Because it opens you up to uh, issues of misinterpretation and most importantly, additional complications, presumably the patient's uh, TB here. So absolutely breathtaking case. Uh, and I'm so glad that um, this patient was under your care because I can guarantee you in many other places, many other people, this person probably wouldn't have had diagnostic clarity. And you have given th this person almost complete diagnostic clarity with everything you've done. So uh, absolutely outstanding. This one will stick for, for a long, long, long time. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, I would just like to add some teaching points that I just gathered from this. So the histoplasma probably we were thinking is because of the pigeon exposure because uh, I was just looking up retrospectively gardening and pigeon and here uh, in this state there's a huge amount of pigeons every household is very commonly in a uh, very common pigeon exposure so that was one thing we were considering uh, because off late in the past one year we have been seeing increasing amount of uh, histoplasma infections as well so uh, that is one thing and uh, Sarcoidosis, elderly, that was an odd point uh, for sarcoid. And Ravi was saying something of uh, the clues that would differentiate histo from TB. So uh, could you just enlighten us as well about these as well? Yeah, I would love to. Let me show you. I actually took this uh, information from um, uh, from a from Twitter. And a person who practices, um, I think, I believe, I don't want to misquote, I, I believe he practices in uh, Kashmir. And this, is, I just copied, I, I actually have the Twitter thread, but I'll share it with you. I haven't turned it into a visual, but um, the t histo is more likely than TB. And here's the Twitter thread you can look at when you have a high ferritin and pancytopenia. And here was the clue that hypercalcemia out of proportion to lymphadenopathy. Um uh, so yeah, I think you can try to look at articles that try to differentiate histo versus TB. But here in this in this instance, the patient had the ferritin, had the pancytopenia, and had um, hypercalcemia without uh, out of proportion to the lymphadenopathy. Usually in TB, the patient's riddled with the lymph nodes. Um, uh, yeah, so those were uh, and uh, that's what that was the premise behind that statement when when the case was that is so a lot of hypercalcemia, a lot of pancytopenia and a lot of ferritin, um, but of course, not enough to uh, seal the deal, just enough to um, be suspicious. And a huge thanks to uh, the case review committee, Yas and Noah. So they helped me put up this case, like so much of information I just sent them and they just summarized the whole thing for me. Thank you so much to both of them as well. You are so kind, VJ. And I'm not surprised it took two all-star members from the case review committee to package a very complicated case into such an educational experience. Thank you. All right, David, take us home, please.
Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much Lee, for the case, it was uh, amazing. Um, I love this uh, situation somewhere because uh, there's a, a very uh, long uh, explanation of, of all of that. Um, but we, we begin the, the case with uh, current fever, um, which make us prioritize uh, elicit infections, also, also unusual infections and autoimmune and malignity. Uh, Ravi and Andresa told us some uh, clues in the, in the API and the um, and the presentation that could lead to towards uh, infection, malignancy, or, or autoimmune. Um, but in the end, we, we uh, knew that uh, the patient had a chronic reticulomyocardial activation, and that um, made us think of granulomatous uh, diseases, especially salvigresis, lymphoma, but also granulomatous infections such as mycobacterial and, and endemic mycobacterial. Um, there are many products, uh, but I like especially the, the ones that uh, are here. In the pulmonary findings, should make us uh, prioritize uh, infections more than, than other granulomatous process. And the one that we share about uh, hypercalcemia out of proportion to life, making uh, making system more, more probably than, than TB. Um, we then uh, went through through subacute uh, cardiac lesions, uh, DDX, um, with infections, malignancy, and anatomy. But then the the what uh, finally did us the the diagnosis was uh, was in that uh, intracellular inclusion in the, in the bone marrow. Um, and I like uh, the fact that they were not, not consistent with fungi, but we have to to take um. Uh, in the front of other other processes such as uh, bizarre leukemiasis and chronic immune activation due to due to vector that could also cause uh, intracellular inclusions. And uh, in the end, uh, we, we asked ourselves uh, why not uh, responsive to to amputation in that case? Uh, could this uh, be not a not a fungus? Uh, could there, there be an excess or or the of immune activation or also, could it could, uh, be due to uh, uncontrolled uh, that such as in this case with, with the with the central with, with the CNS asset. Um, and I think that in, in this case also the the, the a great parallel and um, a great teaching point to, to take um, is that the indolent presentation uh, of this case that appears to be uh, may not. The uh, that case in, in the end, and the the therapies were probably uh, making us uh, don't see uh, the real problem. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I, as folks are saying in the chat, that was so incredibly well organized. It's such a tough task to summarize the teaching in this case, and I think you've done it visually, and you've done it uh, by narrowing narrating the highlights in this case thank you all so much thank you vj for a really cool case prof Red's always a pleasure um and uh we hope to see you guys next time have a great friday